Okay. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, oh. oh my god. Oh my god. Holy shit. Like, what what, 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 just, what happened? just happened? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to OD on Music. Today is going to be absolutely fun. We're going to be talking about a brilliant, brilliant band, Toto. Two amazing musicians, fellow Toto heads. First, let's meet Mr. Bruce Lee Money. Suddenly. Second panelist, the the most amazing, the brilliant. Mr. Keith Peters. Hello, sir. How are you? Oh. Mm-hmm. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Very happy to say. Return ODM panelist, which is pretty cool. <laughs> I like the the other bass player came in later. Right. Right. Pink Floyd bassist in India, he's like Dilse bassist. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how that happened? Raman <laughs> So let's say hi to Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Namaskarams. Great to be here again. Thank you for having me. It's always good to get on these nice chats with all of you. The last time we saw Bruce, we were talking about Dave Matthews Band. Uh, I think what uh, what Dave plays on the guitar with his particular, you know, flexed out <laughs> chord chord progressions, they are they are endlessly innovative. We might have other special guests joining us too, but for now, let's talk about Toto. If there's a band that I can say defines the word underrated, that would be Toto. So they were all sessions musicians. If you're a sessions musician, you have to be at the top of your skill level. Studio time is expensive, it's very less. You need to go into the studio and as less time as possible, lay down the track, get it down and get exactly the way somebody needs and even try it, even if improvising, do something interesting and then go out. You shouldn't make, take time. For so these guys were the greatest session musicians of all time. And when they got together, they formed the band Toto. Now, before that, let's start with Keith. Uh, Keith is a definition of a sessions artist, as you would call somebody in India. We know uh, almost all of us, uh, I'm pretty sure everybody knows Keith because of his days with A.R. Rahman, where he was a sessions bassist for AR Roman. So first I'd like to ask uh, Keith, first of all is, uh, does Sessions music work the same way in India? And you know, uh, as a Sessions musician, how is life in India? If you want a frank opinion, Rayman, I don't know what kind of style you adapted to. Because whenever I used to go play a track for him, let's say I started playing for him, Sessions was actually playing jingles before his daily, the movie thing kicked in. He'll always call me during the mixing time. When he's doing the mix down, he's called me to play this. I don't know what's the trick, the whatever it is. So that's how my session used to work. He called me to say, okay, come and play. So that from the movie, jingles, it became the movie. So every session of his was always the last minute. <laughs> okay. So wanted, comparing to abroad, no, abroad they might be playing, taking a, maybe bring a live take together. Or bass is playing in between. But his way of working was, I mean, that was his style. Okay. And then other music directors started, who came after them, started following this same principle. Okay. Regarding me, I'm talking about myself. You asked yeah. me how was how yeah, was, as a how, sessions musician. Yeah. How were my sessions? My sessions yeah. are always like this, even till today. Even so, a week ago, I went for a recording, the last, the full song was there. I just had to play bass over the song. 
So that's very interesting because, as I told you, Toto was a band which is made up of sessions musicians. So obviously, whenever they start, they right. need to be there at the top of the game, and they need to be able to put down their tracks as perfectly as possible, which, as evident, Keith is a master of. Right now, let's go to what Toto became. So Toto then became a band. and bands record music differently yeah so let's go talk to bruce about that now bruce as a band which has lots of different musicians of varying abilities and skills how does that work as recording as a band well you know for us from the beginning back in the day in you know uh, for our first i think five or six albums i think we still and preferred playing live because we always felt that we sounded better when we played together as a band and so we'd have to try and find a place to record where we could all perform the songs pretty much like we were playing them on stage and uh, it also placed some pressure on us to get things done quicker uh, because again like you like you rightly said in the beginning studio time is uh, is expensive and you don't want to spend more time than you absolutely require Uh, and it's only across the last four or five years when we've been working a lot in our home studios. Like this is my studio right now, and you know where uh, this time constraint is kind of stretching. Now you feel like, hey, you can do, you know, take 235 on that solo, or just nail that, you know, eight-part harmony in one. <laughs> you know, you 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 start thinking like that a little bit, but and you have to pull yourself back from that sometimes because, you know, while the the addictive thing about hey you can go back and fix something you can you can keep zooming in and keep tweaking and tweaking and tweaking there's something really nice about being able to walk into a room with four other people with a song you've rehearsed a couple of times and just rip out two takes and say that's it it's it i mean of course it can get better of course you can keep tweaking and keep tinkering and keep making it better for the rest of your life you can keep doing that but you do those two takes and you say you pick one and say that's it that's that's the one that's going on the record not forgetting punching punching <laughs> punching <Yeah. laughs> punching so kids when we when we when we first started recording because we didn't have but this was our first album 2000 2000 uh, late 99 2000 we were recording right. on S, svhs tapes right yeah. so those two svhs machines and you to and your this will be on master they'll be on slave because only eight tracks on one and all that so punchin was a nightmare it was like oh you have to catch it you have to get exactly you have to have the right fellow doing it so punchins were were strongly discouraged by our first engineer he's like no 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 i can't do all this punchin business i don't know your music anyway so you buggers better nail it in your first shot or second shot that's it so yeah yeah so yeah punchins all were punchins were later <laughs> Now before we start the whole thing I want to say there is a particular song that we will not mention and we will not talk about okay I'll just give a clue that song is famous only thanks to memes and comedy routines on late night shows okay so other than that song we are free to talk about any other song <laughs> uh, I, I i think the first song that everyone hears of course is africa because just how big it is and i i think we heard uh, a college band i think it was a chennai college band i don't know if it was loyola college or something do it at one of the competitions we took part in and i think that's what uh, you know i heard that song and then the bass player at the band that time still said hey this is this is toto you need to listen to toto i mean they're a great band and uh, i think that's when i i picked up uh, toto 4 of course and then some of their older stuff and then uh, uh, actually the the album i probably listened to the most is mind fields which is something that i bought in the early 2000s uh, with simon phillips uh, uh, playing drums of course in that one and uh, and also because our engineer for a long time niranjan Uh, would always check up PA with the first song from Mind Fields, so it was always that <laughs> you know <laughs> Re- reference. Yes, that was his reference. He would put that on and and tune the PA based on that. <laughs> you know, na 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 first song and he would always check the pa with that so uh 
you know so that's that's pretty much how i got into the band and of course steve lukather was uh, uh, for all guitar players he's one of those guys that you look up to and then and then you hear about that one take solo he did on a lionel richie song right at the end that's a bloody four and a half minute solo or something he takes it he nailed in uh, they nailed in one take and then yeah and, and uh, people talk about uh, him i mean and, and with good reason uh, reverentially because of his just that ability to play what's right for the song and still be like really really amazing at that not necessarily always okay i'll just play minimal notes i'll 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 rip i'll do what i want but it will be right for the song you know so yeah that's that's my scene with toto man excellent keith how did you discover toto and what's your I toto story well i in, uh, in my house also alone my family my music was straight away given to me to the car so we used to use this to was also passed on to me chick korea weather oh yeah okay. absolutely I'm really sorry uh, keith i am really sorry i need to ask a special guest to join us uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, welcome lelan sclar the actual basis for toto <laughs> okay no, no, the oh, oh my god how are you doing i'm good thank you lee thank you so much it's an early morning i know i hope you've had your coffee <laughs> no not yet <laughs> uh lee i just want to quickly introduce you to that gentleman uh, having the bass is keith peters uh, he plays the bass for ar rahman and he used he played the bass in the very first toto tribute uh, gig i ever heard in india oh, and, fantastic and the gentleman Hi, <laughs> And the gentleman with all the guitars at the back is Bruce Lee, who is the singer-songwriter of a band called Thermal and Quarter from Bangalore. And we have a lot of other participants who are also great fans. But thank you for joining us, Lee. Oh, it's my it's my pleasure. More than anything, I want to wish everybody the very best because we're seeing how much is going on in India right now with yeah, COVID. Yeah. And man, my my heart is is with you all. You know, and just hoping everybody can be safe and. you know and stay you know stay out of harm's way it's uh, very scary yeah thank, yeah thank, thank you right. thank you so much for that lee it means a lot uh, it's just crazy across the last couple of days i've had so many friends from outside the country uh, actually you know message me i did a couple of calls with friends in in ireland and new zealand and everything people just saying i hope you guys are okay it's scary and grim and terrible right here right now and it's in fact uh, it's it's at the back of our minds all the time and even when we are on this call and we're talking about music we love and musicians that we admire it's uh, it's it's pretty scary out there and thank you so much for that really means a lot yeah appreciate it a lot so uh, lee can i just directly ask you when sure. did you hear toto first and i want to hear the story of you meeting steve lukather for the first time i know that story so Well, I mean I knew all the guys from Toto before they were Toto. I mean we were all in the studio together and friends. I had done sessions with David Page. I um I, I Jeff was I was very very close to Jeff. Um we did a lot of uh, things together and uh and uh, we would we would have conversations about them forming a band and uh it was uh, i mean it, it, it was a real interesting time there were all kinds of things going on in los angeles at that point i was doing a a recording session with don henley when he was playing drums on it and don asked me if he thought eagles was a stupid name for a band <laughs> you know and i looked at him and i said i thought beatles was a stupid name for a band <laughs> so, i said just, just make good music and everything will be fine and yeah. uh but but i think the very first session i did with uh luke was at conway studios uh when he was 19 years old and uh i i just uh, i i sat there just kind of in awe 
of this little pimple face squirt coming in and just, you know, I mean, this you any, Steve. <laughs> he's such a punk. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was it was great. I, I, I was blown away by by his facility, his musicianship. And uh, and I've always loved his personality. He's just one of the most enjoyable human beings I've ever known. And um, yeah, I really uh, cherish every bit of time I've ever gotten to spend with Luke. And I loved all the guys. I was I was about 10 years older than than the other guys. I think Luke and I are about 10 years apart. So I was already in an established situation by the time they started. I wanted to do at that point was be supportive because I knew how good they, they all were. So I would tell people, you got to hire this guy. He's really great. And uh, and we had a ball. I mean, I, I love them dearly. Uh, my, my heart constantly breaks for the uh, Picaro family. Uh, one of the nicest families I've ever known in my life to have built, been dealt so many terrible situations losing Mike and and Jeff and yeah, yeah, yeah. almost almost losing Steve and that and then now Joe gone it's a it's a tough one but their legacy is is so profound um, their place in in contemporary music history is pretty deep true, very true. Very true. Uh, Lee you played on thousands and thousands of albums but every yep. single video there's somebody who's like can you tell us a toto story can you talk to us about toto can you tell us about personal or interesting stories that you have with the toto band when you toured with them well i mean it was a surprise number one um when they when i was working with luke and that's when he told me he said that like mike wasn't doing well and that um they were potentially going to cancel um, their their tour and uh, because he just couldn't his hands just weren't working anymore and uh, and, and he asked me if there was any way that um, I would be able to take over for him and finish this tour which was still they had a lot of gigs left to go um, and, and there was it was a week before we were leaving for Dubai to do the jazz festival was the first gig I played with them and uh, I had a few things in my book, but I contacted the people and explained the situation that was going on and, and, and they let me get out of those. They were some recording projects. They weren't touring or anything like that. I would never walk out on somebody's tour, um, but I but I, I, I had a long talk with, with these couple of people and, and they said, no, it, that sounds like an important thing to do. And uh, and that was when uh, we made that little video uh, at Simon's studio with me and Mike, where Mike talked about that he wasn't going to be able to go on anymore, but that he had asked me to take over for him. Uh, and then the challenge was to take those five days and learn their show. Um, and uh, I pretty much immersed myself in, um, in their music because I didn't want it to feel different. Uh, it would look different, but uh, I wanted to honor Mike's parts. So I wanted to be as, as seamless as possible. So they gave me uh, a board mix of the, of the show they were doing. And um, the first day, all I did was um, I, I wrote down the keys of each song. So when I was listening to it, I could visualize where I was on the instrument because uh, I, knowing the key like, rather than trying to learn the songs and then figuring out what, what where I am on my neck. Um, so I, the first day I, I did that and I drove around in my truck and I just listened to the show over and over and over. And then the next day I sat down and I started playing and I was probably putting in about 12 hours a day. And on the fifth day, we went to Simon's studio and, uh, and ran the show once, uh, you know, and checked a couple of things. And then next day we we flew to Dubai, and uh, it was crazy. I, I, the, one of the hardest parts for me was as much as I love the um, falling in between video. Um, we filmed that video the second week of the tour. Um, they were already committed to that schedule, and at, at that point I was still wrapping my head 
around the songs and, and the show. And I remember about a month or six weeks later, um, Simon and I looked at each other and said, man, wish we were recording now because it, it, it had settled in. And as the tour went on, I didn't change it dramatically, but I, I started to do things the way I heard them um, as compared to trying to honor everything that, that Mike did. Not, and his, his stuff was all great, but that Mike is Mike and I'm me. And uh, so I, you know, I just changed a few nuances in it, but it just got more and more comfortable. I love the guys. I, I would love to have been able just to stay with them and do it. But, you know, the, the second time they asked me to go out, I was doing Phil Collins and I, I had to... Got an idea. Lee, so. uh, just before you joined, we were talking to uh, Keith and uh, Bruce about sessions musicians. You're one of the greatest sessions bassists of all time. So, Lee, when you hear Toto from your side, so what do you think about the music of Toto? What when you first heard the music that your friends and your the guy, the, the kids that you saw playing in front of you, when you heard that music, what what went through your brain and what did you think of that lineup? I thought, what a bunch of punks. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the thing that's beautiful about it is, you know, they understand, they have great pop sensibility in in their in their writing in terms of really great hooks. Um, they they really write, you know, really good lyrics for the kind of music that they do. But they also have a, an incredible maturity in, in, in their musical knowledge. So we always would joke about things like Toto and, and Steely Dan and groups like that. You go, oh man, they're using adult chords. You know, it's not a, it's not like you know some silly little fluffy stuff. I mean, they were really a, accomplished musicians and and really with a great depth of 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 knowledge. So. Um, so it was, when I hear them, it's very satisfying and fulfilling because it, it, it's, it's very rich. It's kind of like, almost like peeling an onion. There's so many layers to it. You've got, you know, really hooky lyrics. You've got some great hooks. You've got unbelievable musicianship because everybody that's ever, ever been within that band, it's a great musician. Uh, you know, I mean, th that's the beauty of a band like that is you have a band name and pretty much, I think, if you have Luke, you have Toto um, because all the other seats, there's been different lineups, but he's been the constant um, throughout this this entire experience. Um, but when, you, when you're listening to the music, it's, it's rich in, in its structure and rich in, it, in, in its concept. There's no like silly, you know, novelty tunes or um, anything lightweight. Um, so <laughs> it, 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 you can be a, a, a new listener who doesn't really understand that much music and just enjoy it from the pure joy of how the music sounds. And you can be somebody who's, you know, far more of a musicologist and deeper into music that can dig in deeper and deeper and really see some of the amazing things that they've come up playing. But again, for me, when they called me, I mean, the challenge was it wasn't like somebody calling me to join a blues band where they would just say, hey, shuffle and see and count it off and you're out playing. I mean, the nuances in the music, <laughs> you know, time changes and different, different things are pretty, pretty deep. I, I love those guys. You know, they've always been one of my favorite, not only bands, but favorite uh, friendship groups and you know, musicians to, to be with. And uh, Lee, let's, uh, I know this, you know, I know it's early Sunday morning for you, but quickly, can I just ask a few of the people here to, you know, sure. ask you some questions? So first, uh, uh, Bruce, uh, would you like to, if you'd like to. Wow. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm just so happy to uh, be on the same virtual room with uh, with you, Lee. I mean, uh, I, I, I first saw some of your YouTube videos thanks to uh, uh, the founder, bass player of my band, who lives in London, and he said, "You've got to, you've got to check this guy out." On, and I said, "Of course, I know," but I've, 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 I hadn't seen your YouTube videos before that, and they're amazing. They're really, really cool. I love playing this song live. And uh, I've, 
I mean, for for me, bands like some of the bands you mentioned, Steely Dan, Toto, that's been it's it's been a, a kind of life's journey for me to try and somehow crack that 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 kind of writing, which is like you said, so so wonderfully. It's like an onion, right? If you want to, you can you can enjoy it just from the outside. It's there's a nice pungency, there's a nice kind of hook that will get to you. And then if you want to get your eyes really watering, you start peeling away the layers, and after a while, you find so much depth in there. I mean, for for for. Um, uh you as a bass player uh i mean and and so often bass players get kind of you know not as much credit as they deserve i think uh, amen amen uh, bro I, amen <laughs> you know and working with with so many bands like this how would you, how would you characterize your 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 creative contributions like keith said in the beginning you know it's kind of weird when you get called to do a session after the whole track is done and you just play you know what's already done but uh, i i'm assuming that things were quite different when you were working with these people you were you were very much part of the creative process from the very beginning right was, was that the way it yeah. was the pandemic only intensified the separation of us but as as years went on um people were doing more and more projects where they would just send you files or you know you'd be brought in in a different time frame within an album project my greatest joy is being in the studio with all the players and feeding off of each other's energy and ideas and i think anybody who's a who's a musician the greatest joy you can have is playing with other musicians it's not sitting at home in you know in your bedroom or your garage just you know, i mean you can be creative and you can do all the things you have to do but when you sit in in a room with other like-minded people that's when really the magic happens to work with guys like that was was always thrilling because there were so many ideas you know being thrown around and you can take something from that first layer of the onion and all of a sudden you you've got vindaloo in the middle and your eyes are watering <laughs> and I'm, I'm I'm burning I'm burning um and then you move up to a fall or something like that and, um I really had the you know the great pleasure of worked on I don't know 25 2600 albums and it, and for me the, for me the, the real joy of it has been the the amount of different genres to play in so you know to have toto uh even though i never recorded with toto i i yeah. the only the only recording i did with them was was luke's solo records those couple of solo albums but luke's solo stuff isn't that far from toto so to be in the studio with with luke um doing solos felt like what it was probably like for those guys when they were in with Toto the playing is there so you're right in you're immediately right into the creative process you're not like carrying somebody who isn't really up to the uh, up to the rest of the players or something which can happen many times um mm -hmm. it, it not often at this at this point in my life but you 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 could end up on a session and a it's it's a new drummer like maybe the singer's got a buddy that he plays on the road with and he wants him to have a chance to work on the record and uh mm. and then you get in there and you go oh god you know this isn't quite you know this isn't quite locking in and and it's not to degrade the person it's just they don't have the experience yet or anything like that but i always prefer when it when it goes to the next level and and it and is live uh, then then you see whether you really did the right thing because you look at that audience and you can tell immediately um whether you're connecting or not and if okay. you're not connecting you did something wrong yeah i don't know, I don't know if that makes any sense i'm just i mean thinking. after 2600 albums anything that you can do wrong i mean come on <laughs> just get <getting> started <laughs> okay uh keith keith peters yes so yes. i think he answered my question the master spoke for himself I just wanted to ask him if you ever record an album with Toto as a band, but then he said no. He said you need to record it with Luke. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they 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 had always been, you know, between David, you know, and, and Mike, they were always covered in the studio, uh, and it yeah. really wasn't. It really wasn't until Mike got ill that that he, there was even a thought. I mean, if Mike hadn't gotten ill, he he would still be there. you know and that that yeah. to me i mean that was really the worst part of this whole thing is i loved all the i love all the guys i love the band and to play with them was a thrill 
but I hated why I was playing with them. Hmm. And uh, it would have been a different complexion had like Mike said, look, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm quitting, you know, and that if they would have said, well, do you want to do it? I, then I would have done it with pure joy. So it was a double edged sword for me uh, exactly. doing that, yeah. that work. Um, and I was, I was, I was, yeah, yeah. I was, I was proud to have, you know, been, but uh, uh, during the whole tour, because he also hadn't been fully diagnosed yet, so we didn't know uh, ultimately how how terrible it was, because they were still thinking lupus and, and different things were, were possible. But um, I kept sitting there going, there's nothing I would like better than to get a phone call from Mike and going, uh, pack your bags, I'm back. You know, I would I would have, <laughs> I would happily have gone or stayed on and been his roadie, you know, and just. Uh, hung out with him, but uh, but it was not to be. And it breaks my heart that he suffered for so long and went through all the things he went yes. through. I think that was in 2010, and that's when I met Steve. Yeah, yeah. When I said, ask him, how's Mike? He said, not doing very well, brother. Please pray for him. So I said, the band when it continue over. He said, yeah, we're thinking, we're thinking of getting in Lee. <laughs> for my head. Good choice. So, <laughs> I'm going to bring everybody in now. So, the next person, that's Devjit. Devjit is the lead guitarist and founder of the band Perfect Strangers. They do amazing Toto covers. So, Devjit, over to you. Yeah, okay. Can God my tongue? Because it's just... <laughs> Any of the Toto songs, right? When they play live, uh, the arrangements differ quite a bit. They will take an acoustic take on the thing. Like a song like Rosanna or Pamela, they'll do a very jazz fusion jam at the end. Right? Yeah. So, where do those ideas come from? Like, how do you decide that uh, which song should I take and, you know, let's, let's, let's jam it up and how much of that is really improvised because everything looks improvised but we assume it's it's not it's planned right because it's 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 too tight for it to be improvised so so what's the process behind that um it it actually really is improvised it was a little bit different every night wow. i mean th th that's the beauty of playing with musicians of that caliber is anything goes all it takes is one guy to throw some kind of a lick in and and everybody goes you know just runs with it and uh wow. and uh, some nights we we did that because it was different every night some nights it really went really if it was really going crazy um it went on and and we would just wait for simon to uh to to set up you know da 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 and then, then we would be, yeah uh, yeah yeah um, wow. if you wanted to like to, just to suck it down into almost a whisper and then build it back up every yeah. everybody the, the thing i think and, and i'm sure you guys all think the same way because he's you are all professional musicians but the most important thing is listening it's not about you it's about listening to the entirety of it and so if you start to hear something happening you join in you don't fight it you don't push against it but i remember like when simon would take his drum solo in the show and Luke and, and Greg and I would all gather at the keyboard because we had that line we had to play. We had this melodic line that went through his solo and we would just sit there staring at each other going, one. <laughs> one. Because he was, he was twisting time so much. It was kind of like in, in the 60s, I was an usher at the Hollywood Bowl when the Beatles played there. But I, but I stayed on, I stayed on for the whole season. Uh, they they kept me on. I was a teenager at that point, and one of the most memorable experiences I had was uh, it was the Ravi Shankar India Festival was going on, and I remember spending the whole evening as an usher there.
trying to find one. <laughs> I was, I was, my ear was so not attuned to your music. And, and you would sit there and listen to these extended sections and all of a sudden everybody is boom, like that. And you're like, what are they hearing? Because by the time you find it, you've already lost it again because they've moved on. Um, and that really o opened up a whole world to me. So uh, yeah. we, we could do an entire session just with you. That's a different thing. Right? You, I mean, honestly, we'll talk. We'll, talk. We, we'll, we, we, we'll come to that eventually. My people will call your people. <laughs> Uh, Lee, thank you so much for joining. You know what? Yeah. Uh, one of the sessions that we're going to do eventually, if your person calls my person and we get this going, is I want to just talk about that one bass guitar that you have, which has these signatures. Do you have that right now? Oh my God, you have it. <laughs> okay. Can you show us a few of the autographs? Can you tell us your favorite ones oh, from it's, that? It's, it's crazy. I mean, this started... This is the bass I call Frankenstein that was never a real instrument. This thing is a Charvel body, a, a P bass neck from a 62 P bass neck that I that I reshaped. We reshaped it into a, a 62 jazz profile. In doing that, we had to strip the frets and that this is the first bass I put mandolin frets on. Uh, and then I changed every bass to mandolin frets. Um, these are the very first EMG pickups that Rob Turner made. You can see EMG on the on the surface. Yep, it's a badass bridge. Um, it, this is the very first hip shot detuner. This was the first prototype. On it, wow. you can see where. Uh, <laughs> see if I get this, where Luke signed the neck. Ah. Oh. Hey, Luke. Oh. But I know there are wow. some there are some ki there are some killer autographs on that. I know there are yeah, some autographs I mean, which nobody else has. I'm guessing <laughs> together at well, least in the same also, place. Also, it's it's really I, you can't really see it, but there's an auto. It's right in there. It, it's Jeff Picaro. <laughs> oh, so I've God. got I got Jeff right next to my heart, and I've got Larry London is on the backside. But this has just hundreds and hundreds of different people on here and it, and it goes all over it like on the back in this corner here it's hard to see you know? <laughs> but but george lucas wrote may the force be with you and then peter max the artist oh, wow. made, made a little saturn to go next to it and so let's be let's bb king uh, there's bb uh, uh, that's yeah BB is sort of oh that yeah, is. um wow. that's some but, legacy yeah, I, but I had B.B. King. I've got a Hofner bass, and I did B.B. King's 80th birthday album, and I had him sign my bass. I've got a photograph of B.B. sitting there signing the bass. And uh... <laughs> Okay, uh, so, I have a gift for you, Lilan. I have a gift. Is it that naked picture of you? No, no, not that, <laughs> that's oh, not that one. That one. That's We'd rather live with the pandemic. <laughs> I, download, I downloaded that from the internet anyhow. Okay, I have uh, something for you. Uh, I know your fetish, so I'm gonna add some people. Hi, Dobbs. Oh, look at the look at the beards in this picture. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, cool. Now, Lee, this is for you. Everybody, show your finger to Lee. Okay, <laughs> that's that's a gift, right? Lee, this is from us. Our love to you. We love you, Lee. Nice. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lee. <laughs> Have a great time, everybody. It's this is really a treat, and I'd I'll come back whenever you want. Thank you, thank sir. You so much. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye, Lee. I'll catch up with you soon. So, thank you, one and all. That's the end of the session. Have a good evening and good night. Bye, okay. everyone. Hi, I am Bertie Ashley, and I'm stuck inside this box, and they won't let me out until you share, like, and subscribe to this channel. If you like what you saw in today's episode, come and join OD on Music. There's lots more good music coming your way.